This year's talk is uh, uh, Brewing on the Ones, or as I like to think of it, Zen in the Heart of Home Brewing. This is going into Zymergy eventually, so I would love to have everybody's feedback on the talk and what you think and some alternate ideas to help me kind of flesh out the concept. What's gone now is kind of the old horror story days where, you know, you walked into a shop and they had, you know, things in paper bags, hops out on the shelf. Uh, it wasn't even that long ago I walked into a, into a brew store in Florida and found bagged pellet hops in a brown paper bag stapled over the edges and just kind of hanging out there. Uh, but that's really kind of uh, uh, completely gone nowadays. According to the fine folks over at Northern Brewer, uh, they actually carry now 121 different grain choices and 90 different types of hops. So this can give you kind of an idea. You can track down any ingredient. This isn't like the old days where uh, when the Falcons were uh, just relatively new in 1980, we did bulk grain orders from Great Western because it was the only way to get reliable brewing malt. You know, nowadays, anything at your fingertips, on the web, at your local shop, wherever, it's just you know, kind of confusing. So again, the plethora of ingredients is confusing and kind of tempting. Uh, it's what I kind of refer to as the kid in the candy, candy store syndrome. How many times have you guys walked down, up and down the aisles of your brew shop and gone, you know, I could use some of that in my recipe, and oh, I've never seen that before. You know, and go, okay, a little of this, a little of that, and the next thing you know, all your beers taste brown. <laughs> how, many people, how many people can visualize that taste of brown in your head? <laughs> yeah. If you've made a beer like that, well, so have I. I've made many. All right, so the confession time. I have been guilty of this. You know, I've, I've walked into the, into, the, into, the, into the grain shop, or the grain section of the store, looked around and gone, I've never heard of this. I must now use this. I have, I have basically a, a homebrew shop in my garage that's filled with things I've bought over time on that basis of, I have never heard this, I must have it. I will put this in my shelves and I will use it eventually. Uh, last time I checked, I think I probably have enough ingredients in my, in my garage to brew an extra 30 batches of beer. <laughs> One of these days I'm going to learn. Uh, now, some of these beers that I've done that way, you know, where I've just gone a little of this, a little of that, have been really great. And some of them have been really wacky. Uh, if you guys have ever seen, I have a recipe called the Gonzo Hemp Poppy Spirit Wine. Uh, you know, it involves like seven different malts. It's a big, nasty, sticky red mess, tons of hops, and then mushrooms, poppy seeds, uh, hemp seeds, tequila, bourbon, and Coca-Cola. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about today. Uh, so what I kind of realized a few years ago was, you know, as I got into kind of the style of brewing where I was just... I was doing a lot of crazy things. I, mean, I still do a lot of crazy things, but I was doing a lot of really nut, nutball type things. I was always, you know, I took the, I took the whole yeast matter very seriously, right? You know, in our club, we have Dr. M, uh, Dr. M. B. Rains, uh, aka the, uh, the woman who wrote that great article we have on yeast that everybody refers to. Uh, M. B. drilled that into everybody's head in the club. What are you doing with your yeast? Why are you not taking care of your yeast? And one of those lessons was not only just do a starter, it was always if you're going to brew something big, if you're going to brew something kind of nutty, then you really want to make sure you have a ton of yeast ready for you, right? So the right thing to do is go and make a starter beer. You know, don't, uh, don't fiff around with, you know, oh, I've got a quart of starter that I made from DME and some yeast nutrient. No, go and make five gallons of beer. You're going to drink it, you're going to enjoy it, and you're going to have a giant amount of yeast for your next batch. So I got into the habit of doing this. Like whenever I was doing a, a 10%, 11%, 12% beer, the first thing I did was I made a 5%, a 6% starter batch. You know, something simple, and I didn't really put a lot of thought into it. You know, it's kind of like, uh, I'll just do this and some of this, and that, that'll be enough, and that'll give me something drinkable, and on we go with the main show. This will be awesome. And then what I've realized is after months of waiting for an awesome beer to arrive, the awesome beer was actually the starter beer that's already been drunk and gone. And the main beer that I had is kind of meh at best, right? Back to the Brown syndrome, right? So I'll give you a great example of this. This is a kind of an earlier uh, recipe of mine. It was the first double IPA I ever brewed. This was back in 2003, double trouble uh, double IPA. And this was back during the days when you know, I had all those great arguments with the kind of veteran brewers in the, in the club going, 
there is no such thing as a double IPA, it's just a barley wine. You know, this was kind of the attitude at the time, it was the argument. What makes a double IPA different than a barley wine? And so, you know, I kind of set out to say, oh, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll prove it to you. I will make some of this double IPA. And so this was my first recipe. One, two, three, four, five, six different types of malt. But that's not all, because there's more. Yeah, I don't. I think that just speaks for itself, doesn't it? Yeah. So there's kind of been a response to this. Uh, you guys have uh, probably now heard of uh, Smash. And the response all falls along the lines of what uh, they call in marketing and uh, sales work as a consumer constraint. Uh, the idea is that if you uh, limit choices, people are actually more happy. They've done a number of studies on this. It turns out if I come up to you and I say, I will give you a steak dinner, I offer you no choice. Odds are gonna be you're fairly happy with the idea of a steak dinner. But if I then come up to you and say, I will give you a steak dinner or a lobster dinner, your choice. Turns out that when you look at, the, you look at what people choose and how they respond to those, uh, to those choices, the more choices they have, the less happy they were with the result of their choice. So uh, consumer constraint, and Smash is kind of a self-restricting version of this, right? So Smash, single malt, single hop, as near as I can tell, the actual Smash word was coined by the folks over at uh, homebrewtalk.com. So if anybody out there is on that forum, congratulations. You're in the history books. Um, and so again, in case you've never heard of it, it's basically beers that are made with a single variety of malt, hopped with a single uh, hop variety. You can use them anywhere that you want, here, there, everywhere. Stuff them up your nose, put them in the hop bag, put them in, you know, in the counterflow chiller, I don't know. Uh, and obviously because of this, the most popular thing that's out there is the Smash Pale Ale. Uh, and that kind of came up because, uh, remember, the, uh, remember the deep, dark times of the hop crisis? Back when the thing that we were worried about was not the fact that we couldn't get our hands on Simcoe or Citra or you know, any one of the other hot shit varieties right now, but the real problem was, holy crap, there are no hops anywhere. Where do we get Cascade? I know, we'll go to Argentina. <laughs> Don't do the Argentinian Cascades, right? No. Yeah, very, very bad. Well, so Smash, the Smash Pale Ale kind of came up during this period of time because what started happening was we started getting a whole bunch of hop varieties that we'd never heard about before, right? You know, I mean, who would have heard of any of these wackadoodle New Zealand hop strains, you know, that, that were coming around Rawaka and, you know, Pacific Gym and Jade and all this. So people kind of went, well, I've got to play with this. I've got to figure out how to, how to do something with this. And I need to know what these taste like because everybody can tell me what Cascade tastes like, but nobody can even pronounce Rawaka. What is Smash good for? It's not absolutely nothing. Uh, ingredient exploration. Uh, we talked about the hops, the increased variety that we had. We even see commercial brewers now doing this today. How many people have seen like uh, hop series IPAs from like McKellar? Uh, obviously, there's uh, the stuff that's been pouring downstairs. You know, very nice little hop experiment. It's very easy to do. I do have one exception to this. I never, ever, ever do a low alpha acid hop smash beer. It's pointless because low alpha acid hops, if you're gonna try and get your bitterness, you know, you're gonna to have to load your kettle with a crap ton of hops. You know, I mean, you might as well just you know, press them back out. But really, I mean, are you going to try and do something with 2.2% Czech Zots you know, as your bittering hop? And the only thing you're gonna get is you're not gonna taste the hop, you're gonna taste chlorophyll. You're not gonna taste vegetable matter. So uh, my one exception on the hop, uh, the hop idea of Smash is anything that's below about like say 7% alpha acid, don't do the bittering addition. Cheat, slide it off to the side, put something in there like Magnum. Uh, we'll talk more about Magnum later. Uh, malts, uh, you wanna know the difference between uh, US Two Row and Maris Otter? Very easy. Same beer, two different malts. Uh, this is actually, I think, gonna be something that we can start playing around a lot more with. Uh, if you guys saw the other week in the New York Times, there was an article on the rising cult of micro maltsters. Uh, I think, uh, Anybody out there remember it was Valley Malt? Yeah, Valley Malt from Massachusetts was the featured uh, farm in this article. And he's growing up and malting barley specifically out of Western Mass for use by Massachusetts breweries. So this is a very, very cool idea. It's absolutely wonderful. And I really kind of look forward to playing with it. And this is gonna probably be one of the primary vehicles. 
Because at that point in time, you're paying a lot of money for a very kind of basic ingredient, and you need to make sure that you can actually taste it. So that's, what, that's one of those places where I think we're going to get to play soon. Yeast. By far and away the easiest experiment you can ever do. Ten gallons, five gallons gets this, five gallons gets that. Uh, how many people were at my Saison talk last year? No, it was. Yeah, last year, that was basically a, it wasn't smash, but it was close, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But I mean, it was a smashy beer with 13 different yeast strains. Uh, and hey, Saison 3 has come out, for anybody who remembers that the part of the talk. We said, hey, tell White Labs, bug them, get Saison 3 out. They finally laying it out, so there you go. We can make a difference. So, and obviously part of the reason why I love uh, uh, smashing type stuff with yeast is yeast is the single factor that you can change, both the quickest and with the most obvious impact. And then finally, water chemistry. I will fully admit to you right now, I will drop my pants and tell you I don't understand a single damn thing about water chemistry. Even though, <laughs> I, even, though even though John Palmer is my good friend and I go and have lunch with him and whatnot, he would be ashamed of me for saying this, but water chemistry makes me go, hmm? Huh? Yeah. Wait, hold on, cations, anions, uh, this much, what? The only thing I know is gypsum and calcium chloride. All right, yeah, and maybe a little calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, your dark beers, anything you want malty, calcium chloride, anything you want hoppy, gypsum, done. Ta -da. You know, that's about how far I go on water chemistry. I'm fortunate to live in LA. Our water's pretty good for just about anything, unless you're a Pilsner nut, like my good friend John up there, in which case then you actually have to do something. Um, but even though I don't know anything about water chemistry, it's a perfectly wonderful way to experiment with it because now you can tell, oh, you know, I added two tablespoons of calcium, uh, calcium sulfate into my beer and, oh God, I have to throw it away now. Uh, and you'll be able to kind of work out how things work for you that way, even if you don't understand the chemistry. So the beer that you're drinking or that uh, has been uh, being passed around, hopefully everybody's gotten it. This is what, uh, what's called the California Magnum Blonde. This is a straight up smash beer. Uh, one malt, one hop, and just like I was talking about the micro maltsters, well now, Great Western has a series of three different malts that they're calling their state select. They have one for California, Idaho, and Washington, and it's basically barley malt generated from those states. So this is made with the California uh, select two row. Uh, this was a 16 gallon batch, and it had two ounces of magnum added each at 60, 20, and zero minutes. It's nice kind of hoppiness. But you notice, this is uh, one of the things I uh, wanted to talk about, Magnum. This is a full, a full on Magnum beer. This has a nice hoppy character to it, but it's not very distinctive, right? And that's one of the wonderful things about Magnum. Pretty much you can just put it in there and go away. Yep, there we go. Very important lesson I learned out of this. This is 30 pounds of Cal uh, California Select Two Row, ground up nice and fine. And one of the things that it does, yields giant protein. This is the most protein I've ever seen out of a beer just after, after chilling. Each of the two carboys here, uh, the one on the left, has been settling for about 15 minutes at that point. The one on the right has been settling for about five. And you can tell, you know, it's just clumping up like mad. So smash is not just like this arbitrary concept that we've made up. Uh, Turns out, if you look at the, the big wide world of beer, there's a whole bunch of beers out there that are basically smash beers, right? These are all perfectly acceptable things to do as smashy type stuff. You know, great, uh, bass, uh, the bass barley wine, you know, the, the vaunted great bass barley wine of yore, was nothing but Maris Otter, nothing but pale malt. Uh, same thing, uh, how many people saw Mitch's talk earlier today? Yeah, so uh, I was in, in there and uh, he said, oh, the classic Burton IPA was just pale malt. I'm like, awesome, into the slide. So there you go. Every single one of these, check pills. It's a one malt beer. If you're putting anything other than, uh, anything other than Moravian two row, you know, it's kind of like, well, okay, you're gilding the lily. But it's one, uh, one malt and they actually do do zots for their, uh, for their bittering, right? Uh, but fortunately, they seem to have higher alphas than we're getting recently. So, and you can also make a really boring double IPA. Imagine this, kind of kicked up, but with Columbus or Centennial instead. It wouldn't actually be that bad. Brewing on the ones, to the title of the talk, finally. Uh, smash is fine. It's a, perfectly, it's a perfectly valid way of brewing, but it turns out it's kind of limited and, to me, kind of boring, right? This beer is not 
exciting in the least. Now, some of the, I'll tell you what, the Saison part, that is pretty exciting, that's nice. Uh, but, so let's just go ahead and expand it. It doesn't take much, right? All we have to do is say, instead of doing one malt and one hop, it's now one malt, one thing to give you color or flavor or an adjunct, uh, one sugar, one hop, one spice, one extra flavoring, like, you know, uh, how many people have ever made uh, homemade uh, tinctures at, uh, to use for your brews? It's a completely awesome technique, you should do it. Why do this, right? Again, we go back to the idea of consumer constraint. Turns out, again, you're happiest when your choices are limited. Now, I'm not saying that you know, everybody needs to march around in handcuffs, uh, but this is kind of a, a, kind of a handcuffing technique to force you to be creative inside of a very tight space, right? I mean, if suddenly you can't you know, run around and go, I will now throw three pounds of crystal malt into this beer. How do you get that red color? How do you, how do you get that, that kind of that big caramel flavor? Well, there are ways to do it. You just kind of really got to think about it, right? It, it forces you to kind of expand yourself. Um, in the ones technique as opposed to smash, you know, you still have all of the same sort of advantages of smash. You're still producing relatively clean, simple beers. So you can still do all your exploration. You just end up with a, uh, with a better final product on the side. Uh, you can kind of think of this in, in terms of artistry. Right, you had Picasso, the, you know, two of his most famous periods are his blue and his rose period, right? And very much a conscious choice on his part, you know, using color to reflect his emotions and his emotional state at the time. But again, restricting his palette led to this great flourishing of his art. So we can kind of think of this in that same sort of sense from a brewing point of view. Maybe by doing some restriction, maybe by avoiding taking the easy way in and out of everything, we can actually expand what we're doing, make it more profound, make it better, right? Well, as profound as beer can be. Um, and then lastly, this actually is probably about the closest thing that you can do to what happens in the professional, uh, professional brewing world. How many times have you walked into a professional brewery and realized they don't have Maris Otter, they don't have Pilsner malt, they have the giant ass silo, silo of two row malt that gets blown in every week, right? They have to build everything on that one base malt. And then when you walk into any sort of grain room or grain stores that they have, you're not going to find the homebrew shop in there. You're not going to find sacks upon sacks of all these different caramel malts and Munich malts and Caramel Munich malts and Caramel Munich one, two, three, Caravian, whatever. You know, you're going to have a limited selection. And they actually really, really have to think and justify to themselves before they go off and buy another malt because it's one more thing to have to track, it's one more thing to have to cost out, it's one more thing to have to deal with storing, right? Uh, how many people have ever heard uh, Jamil has talked before in the past about, uh, on his program, about the one sack rule, or the sack rule? Yeah, it's very, it's very true. You don't go into a professional brewing world very often and see them go, all right, this has eight pounds of this, 13 pounds of this, and 620 pounds of that, right? It's more like, okay, that's got 620 pounds out of the silo, one sack of that, and a half a sack of that, and that's it, right? They don't think, uh, they don't think in that way, and you know, you're not gonna do that with a massive inventory. So how many people have uh, recipes that have quarter, uh, quarter pounds of malt in them? Uh, unless it's something like carafa or, God forbid, peat smoke malt. <laughs> don't use peat smoke malt. You, you know, you're not going to get that. I mean, uh, here, I mean, let's go back real quick to that first recipe. Do you think there was a hope in hell that I could detect any of that biscuit malt in that beer? I mean, the Munich malt? Hey, I love Munich, but three quarters of a pound? That's not gonna make a difference. So this is, this is why I think of this recipe. This is, this is very much a rookie recipe. This is, I mean, I can tell you why I was thinking, oh, well, I want the Munich malt in there because I want to enhance the toastiness. You know, I want the wheat malt in there for the heading. Jackass, you've got a pound of hops in this beer. You've got all the foam positive stuff you're ever going to need. Wheat malt's not going to do anything. At least not anything that's going to matter. All I did was complicate, uh, complicate my recipe for no real benefit. So this is a perfect example of what you would see in a home brewer's world that you would not see in a professional world. So some classic one style beers, because again, this is not something I invented out of whole cloth. This is something that's very real. Hefeweizen. 
If you're doing anything except for 70% wheat and 30% uh, Pilsner or Pale, you're being silly. The classic Hefeweizen is that exact grain bill. There's no reason to lard anything else onto it. Same thing with the hops, right? You know, Hefeweizen's not a, not a hoppy beer. You just, uh, here's some Magnum to get me to 19 IBUs. Pale ale, pale malt, maybe a little crystal malt. Same thing with the IPA. Same thing with the double IPA. Triple, and uh, the Gold, Belgian Golden Strongs. Pilsner malt and sugar. You think Duval does anything except for, you know, pills malt, sugar, and then a crap ton of tetra hop extract? I mean, that's pretty much Duval's recipe right there. We Heavy, uh, Track Warehouse. Uh, how many people have ever had the Track Warehouse uh, We Heavy? It is easily one of my most favoriteest beers ever. And that beer is basically Maris Otter boiled for a very long time and a small amount of roasted barley for color. And that's it. So again, brewing on the ones. And there are more and more of these. And my favorite, of course, is the world's best beer, West Letter and 12. Pilsner malt and dark candy syrup. That's it. And please note, that's the world's best beer for some values of best. All right, some less classic ones. A rye wine. I'm just about to brew one of these. I, got a, uh, I just recently got a barrel from uh, Woodenville, right up the road, eight gallon rye barrel. And that's gonna become a, a rye wine that's gonna be 80% Maris Otter and 20% rye malt. That's all it needs. Uh, oat wine, same story. And it makes a really kind of uh, sl you know, sweet, but very potent beer. That's very kind of round and rich. It's a great thing. Your average Brett Wild Ale. Pale malt, maybe a little something like a little Munich. Hell, you don't even need the Munich, just pale malt. Uh, but your Brett Wild Ale, all of that focus is gonna be on the Brett. Don't worry about anything else. This is, a, this is just a one style beer. And then last one, how many people have ever heard of Hapashu? Hapashu, uh, Japanese. It's basically a rice beer. And we say rice beer here and we think, uh, you know, Budweiser. No, Hapashu is rice beer. It has maybe about 5% barley malt in it and everything else is rice. It's, you know, they augment it with enzymes in order to actually get the rice to convert. They do this in Japan because uh, Japan's brewing laws and taxation laws are absolutely insane. And beer is incredibly expensive because the barley is taxed. So in order to make cheap beer, they just make rice beer. And that's Hapashu. And again, it's two things. Rice and the tiniest little bit of uh, barley malt just to get the conversion going. Uh, this was another, uh, this is actually a, a one style recipe. 16 gallons at 1038, five SRM, really, really pale. 18 IBUs, that's all it needs. 23 pounds of Thomas, Fa uh, Thomas Fawcett Maris Otter. Uh, and then two and a half pounds of Weyermann's Rye Malt. Right? So that's about 90 and 10%, right? A little over. One and a half ounces of Progress. And then that's not all. I caramelized the wort. I took the first gallon and a half of wort and reduced it to a quarter gallon of syrup that's my old uh, five, uh, or sorry, that's my old eight gallon brew pot that I used when I was making five gallon batches, sitting on top of a propane burner. Turns out you can take one and a half gallons of wort down to a quarter gallon of syrup in about 15 minutes at high speed, and then scorch your pot. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, actually, if I hadn't scorched the pot, I would have uh, liked to have driven it down even further. Uh, but uh, you can kind of see here, syrup. So we just stirred this right into the boil. Called it a day, and I went forward. All right, let's talk about uh, the uh, Mo ride for a moment. You know, really nice kind of biscuit tone to it, and that's all the Maris Otter. You get the spiciness of the rye. That sweetness that you get, syrup, right? Because at that point, it's caramel. It's not going to come out. And, you know, enough hop character in there to remind you I have hops, but not enough to get in the way. And then you just go on, hey, I'll have another. Let's see, who's surprised that I did a Saison? Anybody? Yeah, okay. Uh, this has been something I've been playing around with a lot. This was actually, uh, this was really the thing that kicked off the whole Ones concept for me. Well, again, last year's uh, Saison talk had a, had a Saison very similar to this. Uh, you know, kind of the same thing, you know, just a, a bunch of uh, Pilsner malt in that one, and I think I had wheat in it. This one is Pilsner, and flaked oats. And again, since I'm restricting my, my palate on purpose here, 
uh, the, my artist palette here. One of the things I did to get a little extra flavor was I toasted the oats. Uh, I mean, a bunch of people have talked about toasting oats before. Throw them in the oven, nice cookie sheet, 350 minutes for 25 minutes, give them a stir a couple times, take them out, pour them into a paper bag, and let them sit for a week before you actually do anything with them. I mean, it, it, it's a wonderful technique, and you get a nice toasted oat character to, to everything now instead of, uh, instead of just uh, greasy oats. 1053, 4 SRM, 30 IBUs. All the IBUs are Magnum. You may notice this obsession with Magnum. It's because Magnum is stupidly easy. And this is just straight up 3711. Definitely carries forward that Saison Funk, right? You get a little bit of kind of a richness and a roundness from the, uh, uh, from the toasted oats. And otherwise the beer just really showcases the yeast, right? So here's the practical takeaway. I don't expect everybody to brew this way. I mean, it's kind of absolutely insane to expect that. You know, you know, I don't expect everybody to walk around in shackles all the time. Uh, but it does change the way that you think about beer and how you brew and how you create your recipes. Uh, kind of think of this like uh, Michelangelo, the, the famous quote that uh, supposedly they said about the David was, you know, how did how'd you make the David? He, he just said, I, well, I looked at the block of marble and took away everything that wasn't David. Right? This is kind of the reverse approach of that. We're building this up. But the idea is, what is the exact minimum that you have to do in order to get to your, your desired goal? Right? Is your, you know, if your desired goal is to have toastiness, then well, there are a couple things you can focus on. But don't go, don't go, I want a toasty beer, so I'm going to do Maris Otter, Munich, Kara Munich, Kara Vien, and that will be toasty beer. And just for fun, I'll throw in some brown malt, because I really want the beer to taste brown. Again, it's what's the bare minimum, right? If you wanted a toasty beer and you wanted that to be the, the dominant character in your beer, you're going to do, go and make a beer that's, say, Munich heavy, right? Or Vienna heavy, depending upon which sort of toasty, crackery type thing that you want. But that's the idea, right? You know, don't, don't go uh, gilding the lily here. It's, you know, kind of build up to exactly where you need to be and don't go over. You know, excess is a wonderful thing, except for when it, uh, when it bites you in the ass. Uh, so this also explains some of the trends that you'll see in my brewing. Uh, Magnum and Warrior for bittering, right? I don't care about any other hop really at the, at the bittering stage. The only exception I have to that rule is if I'm trying to make a really gnarly, uh, you know, bite you in the, in the tongue IPA, then the Warrior will get augmented with a little bit of Chinook. So, uh, and then finally, I think one of the other big things that you can take away from this is, uh, how about we step away from the crystal malts? You know, put down the crystal malt bin, nobody gets hurt. Right? I have a fan. All right, so let's look at Double Trouble again. If I was gonna brew this again to the, uh, today, this is what I would be doing, all right? Still a crap ton of hops in there, very bitter. It's actually got the same bitterness levels and everything else. And, uh, you know, but the malt bill has been simplified. Again, 50-50 on Maris and uh, Pale Malt. Uh, two pounds of Munich Malt. I'll have to shoot somebody in order to find the Simcoe. And this will be a much cleaner beer with a better hop expression. And it won't be as brown tasting on the palate. Here we go again, the summary. Uh, simpler recipe, same gravity. It's a touch paler. It's more bitter, actually. I forgot it's actually more bitter. Cleaner, both on the malt and the hop bill. Not as many confusing flavors three kettle additions instead of seven. <laughs> uh, and then finally, four hop varieties instead of eight. All right? So a little bit simpler, again, a little bit less confusing. All right. So that's it. That's me. If you have questions or comments, please bring them off now. Let's, uh, let's uh, get some people's uh, questions out. If you have questions but you don't feel like asking them in front of a crowd, that's my email address. I answer that thing 18 hours a day.